In this exciting episode, Perry takes the first step in his bid to become a real estate tycoon. Now that is curious. It's season two, episode five of Perry Mason, The Case of the Curious Bride. Welcome to the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy, and my purpose here is pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. I plan to do a pod for every episode of the television series, and as time permits, I'll look at some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each episode, I'll give a brief refresher on the plot, and if the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare the book with its television adaptation. Next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia, as well as tackle the episode's main theme. We'll feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself, and then we'll finish with a post-case water cooler, where just like Perry, Della, and Paul... We can rehash the ins and outs of their adventures. But first, to the law library! Each episode in the law library, we return to prior cases to refresh our memories about Perry's past so we can find fresh precedents for future cases. I probably first heard that a husband or wife cannot be compelled to testify against their spouse from the show Perry Mason. Della brings this legal issue up in today's episode. But you've always said a husband can't testify against a wife. You forget that Cain was her husband. What do you do now? Of course, this is a complicated question. Are Carl Reynolds and Rhoda married or not? So many spouses get offed in Perry Mason that the problem is actually rarer than I initially thought. Marriages are shattered so easily in Perry's world, there really aren't enough existing couples, a defendant, a spouse who's still alive, for a murder trial to test the strength of that marriage. So we've got the case of the nervous accomplice, with Bruce and Sybil Granger. Bruce doesn't get called by the prosecution, so it's not an issue. The case of the sulky girl with Francis Chalane and Rod Gleason doesn't look like the prosecution ever really wants to call Francis Chalane. The case of the Gilded Lily with Charles and Anne Brent. Another example where the prosecution doesn't seek to call the spouse to testify against the husband. The big episode that's dealt with this issue is the case of the fugitive nurse, where the title character has run away with the defendant's husband. In this scene, Berger and Mason nearly come to blows over whether or not Dr. Morris can or can't testify in Janet Morris's murder trial. I call Dr. Charles Morris. Your Honor, the district attorney knows full well that Dr. Morris is the husband of the defendant and as such cannot be called upon to testify against her. Your Honor, Dr. Morris is no longer the husband of the defendant. He now resides in Boca de Oro, Mexico. On March 4th of this year, he obtained a divorce and that divorce is legal where he now resides. But it is not legal in the state of California. He doesn't live in California. It makes no difference. Gentlemen. I gotta say, (laughs) The high points for Hamilton Berger have been few and far between through our first 40 plus episodes. But this little kicker from Berger is spot on. Your Honor, may I say one thing more? Mr. Mason went to Mexico to try to get Dr. Morris to come back with him to testify for the defendant. If the doctor had agreed, Mr. Mason would have maintained that he was perfectly qualified to be a witness. Now when he sees that Dr. Morris will testify for the prosecution, he changes his mind and says he cannot Just because testify. Hamilton Berger is right, of course, doesn't make Perry wrong. What Hamilton's describing is what it means to be a good defense attorney. 
Of course, Perry got his woman in that case, and we'll see how he fares in the case of the Curious Bride. Speaking of, let's get to the plot of our episode. The Case of the Curious Bride Newlyweds in a Perry Mason episode? That gigantic rock on Rhoda Reynolds' finger can't cover up a blackmail problem. A garage with two cars, new clothes, big diamond ring, and a bridegroom with a millionaire father. You expect me to believe you can't raise $2,000? Yep, we're officially in the casting recall phase of Perry Mason, and we're only two seasons in. Rhoda Reynolds was the demure defendant in season one. Her blackmailer, Kane, was Sam Link, the murdered casino owner in the case of the silent partner. The suspects in this case include Rhoda's father-in-law, better known as the defendant from the case of the prodigal parent. Another suspect is Lola from the case of the silent partner, who offed Sam Link. It's all connected. And then when you throw in Ross Hollister from the case of the cautious coquette as Dr. Michael Harris, it's old home week over here. I suspect it will continue to be as the series goes on. So anyway, Rhoda is in trouble with her ex. This is bad news because her father-in-law doesn't like her. He tells his son, Carl, why. Got her all wrong, Dad. She's a wonderful girl. She's a cheap adventuress who sees you as a way to my money. But she's not going to get a penny of it. Welp, Rhoda's got to get that blackmail cash from somewhere. And hubby Carl has to get it from Daddy's checkbook. So Rhoda goes to Perry. You know, for a friend. I understand you have a question to ask me. Well... Actually, I'm here on behalf of a friend. Friend? I see. And so, the question is a little involved. The most legal questions are. But Perry, playing hardball with her. And Rhoda isn't used to swinging at that kind of heat. Three strikes and she's out of here. And consequently, Perry feels bad. So? So I'm not very proud of myself. A girl was badly frightened. I should have drawn her out, won her confidence. I should have helped her. Add to the complications the fact that Arthur Kane is dealing with another scorned woman. Don't you forget, Artie, by 10 tomorrow morning or I'll blow the whistle on you good. So that when Rhoda tries to drug Carl and take care of Kane, she finds herself in more trouble than she was before because someone took care of Kane with a fireplace poker. Perry goes to quick work, and this episode features some of Perry's best, sometimes you gotta cross the line, brand of legal pyrotechnics. One, he indirectly gets Dr. Michael Harris to skedaddle. You might consult a doctor. Oh, what good would that do? I've got dozens of patients with troubles they couldn't talk about, and all I can tell them is to take a long vacation. Now I'm in the same predicament myself. As I said, you might consult a doctor. Two, he starts fooling around with apartment buzzers and sets up a new tenant in the very apartment house where the murder was committed. Well, when you ring the front doorbell, a buzzer sounds. You don't like buzzers. I don't? No, so you get a doorbell from your stock, one that rings. You put it up in place of the buzzer. Later, if somebody should ask you about it... I know. I know. I just don't like buzzes. Three, he starts a divorce proceeding against Carl Reynolds when the issue of his marriage's legality to Rhoda hasn't even been decided yet. There's one thing I can do. File for a divorce on her behalf against Carl Reynolds. But how can she divorce someone she hasn't even been married to? I think I'll let Mr. Berger figure that out. In court, Perry gets Hamilton to blow a gasket over the doorbell alarm clock question. Very well, Mr. Mason. Then instead of bringing charges against you for unethical conduct, when this case is finished, I'll have you indicted for breaking into a house and stealing a doorbell. Just to clear things up here, because it is a bit confusing, 
Perry has completely befuddled the witness, not to get closer to truth, but in order to set his client in a better light. You and I both saw Rhoda inside the apartment with the poker. Perry's fast one gives her an alibi, quote unquote, but that's all smoke and mirrors. Now it's okay because we know that Rhoda didn't really murder Kane, but Perry's buzzer and alarm clock routine is strictly diversionary. Then of course he blows the lid off the case while deposing Carl Reynolds in his office. He had the poker and I, I got it away from him, hit out and he fell. Then I lit a match to see what happened. He was dead. All that he has left to do is assure Della that he was on the up and up the entire time. He purchased the apartment complex. Paul, I suggest you call Mr. Berger and ask him if it's a crime for a landlord to enter his own property to make repairs. Would you mind filing this for me, Della? Which makes the buzzer tampering completely legal. Oh, Perry, you shouldn't have. The episode was based on a 1934 novel. It was the fifth novel ever in the Perry Mason series. There are some things worth pointing out. Up until this particular novel, the location of the Perry Mason novels was left implicit. Now, Earl Stanley Gardner was a California lawyer himself, but the state, much less the city where Mason worked in the first four novels, had remained unspoken. When Mason pulls out a legal precedent in this novel, he appeals to California law, which says, even if we don't know that it's in Los Angeles, yet it is in California. Number two, the names are different, as they often are in the book. Carl's last name is Montaigne, not Reynolds. And the ex-husband is Gregory Lorton, not Kane. Perry is able to show that the Carl isn't really married to Rhoda complaint by the prosecution is completely bogus. Maybe you figured this out too. A guy like Gregory Lorton in the book, Arthur Kane in the television show, has probably been married multiple times and never bothered to get real divorces in any of those cases. So Perry simply puts a woman on the stand who can testify that she was married to the deceased before Rhoda and never got divorced. So that Rhoda's marriage to Gregory Lorton was itself null and void, making her marriage to Carl real. Carl and Rhoda are together, which means Perry can now call for a divorce and get what he really wants, which is Carl in a deposition. Number four, in the book, we don't get access to the direct deposition. Neither do we get access to the direct murder. We get it described by Rhoda, and Perry trots out what happened in the deposition when he's talking to Mr. Montaigne, in a scene that's not included in the show, which is Mason sticking Mr. Montaigne with the legal bill. Pretty sweet. Also, for all you Perry Della relationship advocates out there, the book does feature a scene where they hold hands and Paul catches them. A quick bit of adaptation trivia. This book was adapted into a 1935 film. That was directed by Michael Curtiz. You probably know him best as the director of Casablanca and featuring the first screen appearance of Errol Flynn, who Curtiz later directed in The Adventures of Robin Hood. Yeah, it's true. There were six of these Perry Mason films made in the 1930s. None of them are particularly good. They might be a subject of the Perry pod in the future, I'm not sure. Generally, they're disappointing, but they are necessary ventures for the Perry completist. Now, let's get further trivial, shall we? In 
Each episode in our trivia section, I give you three takeaways. A Paul is a subject worth investigating more. Adela is something about a particular actor or actress in the episode. And a Perry is something we learn about our intrepid hero. Our Paul. We get a lot of psychological mumbo jumbo handed out for why Rhoda marries daddy's boy Carl in the first place. Dr. Michael Harris puts a finger on this. He apparently has a name for it. I quarrel with Dr. Harris about that very thing. He called it my broken wing fixation. So here's our Paul prompt this week. Is this a thing? Broken wing fixation? Is that a diagnosis that's connected with a real school of psychology, psychotherapy, something legitimate? Or is this just like TV hokum for what people thought Freudian psychoanalysis was? Ardella this week concerns Christine White, a.k.a. Rhoda Reynolds. I told you, Mr. Mason, I don't want to divorce Carl. Is that because you feel sorry for him? Yes, you're right. I do feel sorry for him. White was born in Washington, D.C. in 1926 and attended college at UNC Chapel Hill, where she majored in, be still my heart, English. She went back to D.C. after she got her degree and attended Catholic University for her M.A. in speech and drama. She pursued acting for a while in New York City, and she apparently had a brief love affair with James Dean at the Actors Studio, where both were studying, before she moved to California. She proceeded through the 50s and 60s to appear in a host of television shows and a handful of movies. Her credits include three Perry episodes. We saw her in season one. We're going to see her again. Bonanza, Have Gun Will Travel, The Fugitive, The Rifleman, and the uber-famous Twilight Zone episode that's called Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, where she is the wife of William Shatner. Now, she never married. She stopped acting in 1976. She moved back to D.C. to care for her ailing mother, and apparently distributed some kind of quarterly called the Rampart Papers. I saw that in several obituaries, though nobody had more information about what that was. She was 86 when she died in 2013. One passing story I saw that I thought was interesting, Gore Vidal wrote in the 1950s that Joanne Woodward was the person who consistently went for roles in television shows that Christine White got. So when you see her, just think, man, she got roles Joanne Woodward was trying to get? It's true. Our Perry this episode could have involved our hero's really poor decision to smoke in a hospital, but the fact that Dr. Harris, the doctor, actually smokes in the hospital makes it more like a prompt for uh, Paul than something about our intrepid hero, since apparently everybody does it unwisely. No, instead, we're going to deal with Perry's real estate investment. Well, on the day after the murder, I invested in some real estate, a four-family flat. Not the one Arthur Kane. I might have known. We know from the case of the nervous accomplice that, at least when he's pretending to be a ruckus maker, he's a fan of tracked housing and shies away from the highly speculative field of oil drilling. Whatever you're doing's working, Perry. Keep cashing those checks. The theme for this episode is sympathy. Sympathy is a really poor reason for marriage, and we should know this from the start when sad sack Carl Reynolds is seen defending it. I know quite a lot about Rhoda, Dad. In a way, I took advantage of her, of her sympathy when she was nursing me back to health. That's what I think her love really is. Sympathy. Now she thinks I'm dominated by you, and she's trying to cure me of that. I mean, really, in Perry's world, everything is a poor reason for marriage. So, feeling sorry for the man you're caring for isn't a particularly bad one in context. 
This is simply the first episode to declare openly something the show has implicitly been supporting the entire time, that some marriages are worth dissolving. Now, your husband made statements linking you to the murder. These must be branded as lies. There are two ways of doing that. One is for me to subpoena Carl in your divorce suit and try to break down his story. The other is the divorce suit itself, in which you can charge him with having lied. Next week, you go on trial for your life, Rhoda. Isn't it time you stop dodging reality? While we're handing out sympathy here, let's grant a dollop of it to Hamilton Berger, who sits there silent as Perry gets Carl to confess in his office. Now, Hamilton still wants Perry to pay for messing with the crime scene's evidence, but Perry's landlord routine is going to keep him out of jail. Naturally, Berger never thinks of checking on that. He has to be told. Berger's ineptness inspires sympathy, but it's kind of similar to the sympathy that Carl elicits. I guess what I'm saying is that L.A. should work on divorcing their district attorney. Vote this clown out. Now it's time for a Perry proverb. That bit about sympathy was a strong candidate for this episode's proverb, but instead I'm going to go with Perry's response to Papa Reynolds. It's quite a handsome figure, but I've already accepted a retainer for Mrs. Reynolds. I can imagine what a weighty sum that was. Well, perhaps it wasn't very large, but she also gave me something else. What was that? Her trust, Mr. Reynolds. Want to know what Perry wants? His client's trust. Rhoda shows that when she follows Perry's advice and ditches Carl. Despite his protestations of care, Papa Reynolds doesn't really trust his son, nor should he. Trust is thicker than blood. Now, let's grab a swig from the water cooler. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. A research prompt from the last episode involved burning currency. We discussed the Corregidor capture in 1942. Manila Bay, Japanese soldiers defeated the Americans. And that was the explanation for why $10 million had to be torched. Our question was, did this bonfire of bucks have any historical precedent? John Searcy... My father found something close. In the wake of Pearl Harbor, U.S. officials were worried about Japan storming Hawaii and obtaining a bunch of U.S. currency. So they made what they called overprint bills. One dollar, five dollar, ten dollar, and twenty dollar bills that featured the word Hawaii prominently printed across the back of each bill. This way, if Japan invaded and captured the money, the U.S. government could immediately declare the value of the conspicuous overprint notes null and void. So that meant that Hawaii residents had to exchange their U.S. cash for these overprint notes. And in fact, they're still collector's items, you really want the $5 bill. That's the rarest of the four. Of course, this meant that after the war, the U.S. had $200 million in excess cash, which of course had been replaced by the Hawaii overprints. So they had to burn baby burn, and it apparently took a while. They had to requisition a sugar factory to help. Simply fascinating, a fantastic find by my father for this week's Paul Prompt. Thanks so much to those of you who have taken the time to write in and say you are digging the show. Shout out to Tim Cree in Fort Collins, Colorado, who wrote in to say that he's trying to go through the entire series. He's on season three right now and has enjoyed the podcast as a companion. And he gave me some helpful hints as to what to look for in the future of the series. Shout out to Josh Reed, my main man, who campaigned vociferously to be included in the show shout outs, even volunteering a contribution if it would gain him some verbal acknowledgement 
No contribution necessary, Josh. Your presence is present enough. And of course, my Aunt Mai has always sent in her support. I would, for those of you who have not checked out the show on YouTube, check out George Penton's comments on the YouTube version of the Perry Pod episodes from season one if you find yourself on YouTube. In particular, his comment on the case of the half wakened wife attempts to offer a way of reconciling the different military histories we get about Perry Mason in the show. As always, I'd love feedback about this particular episode or the podcast in general. Was there something about this episode that you'd like to comment on or something that you'd like to correct? You can leave comments on the pod's website at theperrypod.libsyn.com or email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find those links in the show notes. All Perry Pod episodes are available via Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Join us next time as Perry finds that time may bury him, but he can't bury time. Or can he? It's the case of the buried clock. Join me, won't you? Until then, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, keep on walking that Park Avenue beat. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.